There are over 10 million refugees in the world today. Over 4 million of them are children. By far the most vulnerable of these are those who have lost their parents or become separated from them. Salt Lake City, Utah is one of only 20 locations in America where the U.S. government resettles unaccompanied refugee children. Here, Catholic Community Services places refugee minors in foster homes and provides social services to them that help them begin a new life. So many kids, like to get the opportunity to come here to America, it's not easy. Because when it's a thousands of people, to be one of the chosen people, it's kind of a miracle. Hi, I'm Nicole. I am a Utah resident. I've lived here 40 years. It just, we just felt like we were not complete without a child. Um, my name is Bodip. When I first came, I was the first girl, um, uh, you know, uh, for the program. And I born in Vietnam, Saigon. And the communists came, and they started to, like, confiscate all the businesses that would be including my parents' business. Bo's parents first tried to get her older sister out of the country, an attempt that was unsuccessful. During her journey, uh, she was captured and, um, you know, put to work labor camp. And my mom made arrangement for my younger sister and I to go to, you know, get on the boat and, and leave the country. Well, uh, we, the, the boat, you know, cost more than what we thought. And so my sister had to left behind. My mom said, how about you go? And with that, Bo was left to venture out into the unknown alone. In many respects, her journey served as a template for other refugee children who had been forced to flee with no fixed destination ahead of them. Okay, I'm from the DRC, and I was a refugee in Uganda in Kampala. There was a war going on in my country. And we couldn't run back home, because if we did, then we couldn't make it, like we could get killed. For refugee children, there's no guarantee of safety while they flee. In fact, they often quite nearly go through hell during their journey. I'm from Nigeria, yeah, eastern part of Nigeria. The police set their eyes on me. They're going to take me to Mali. So the Mali, they called the place 75 kilometers to Hellfire. The place was very hot. That anybody they take to that place, you are gone. I, I was shot. I have a gunshot here. Yeah. So, which I still have uh, some of the bullet in my back now. I realized we were sitting on top of all the manure. It was the boat transport manure. We saw so many stuff. People got killed. Girls, like women, got raped. You know, so many bad stuff and bad experiences. There is a woman give birth on the boat. She didn't have nutrition, really, and milk or anything for the baby, and the baby died. And she had this baby in her hand for over a week before, you know, everybody said, you have to, to let the baby go. If it's not, you will make all of us sick. You know, say, well, I can. And so she jumped and killed herself in the, um, in the ocean. Our boat was kind of like stuck, kind of didn't move as fast as I thought it should be because all this body was on, in the ocean, that the decayed body kind of stuck, kind of prevent our boat to move forward. Just, it just, I mean, hold it, hold it, it just, I have never seen that many, I mean, we can even recognize some of the faces. I was on the sea about 45 days, and so finally we end up in Philippines. Um, in Philippines, there are some like UN and Red Cross, they come and interview us. And they say, well, we, I think, you know, you can go to America. I say, that's great. Where? In America. And they say, Utah. I say, are you sure it's in America? Like I tell everybody in the camp, I'm going to Utah. Are you sure? I say, I asked them the same question. 
but making it to the U.S. is no guarantee refugee children will be placed with a foster family for one simple reason. The shortage, actually, uh, foster family. People in America, meanwhile, may undergo their own journey of pain and loss before deciding to become foster parents. For Nicole, her loss included the ability to bear children after tumors were discovered in her. When we found out, my husband and I were, had been married for six years and it was, we had, uh, they called them fibroid tumors and so they actually did surgery and eradicated everything so that there was no cancer involved. Um, I remember waking up at nighttime and I, I think I'd hear children or I'd hear um, an infant cry and I think that won't be in my house ever again unless, you know, something miraculously happens. I was scooping up everybody's children that were coming around. If they, they needed an extra mom, I was there. I was scooping them all up. Nicole first got the notion to foster children after her younger brother fostered a young girl named Destiny. However, the state returned her to her biological parents, who then beat her so severely she entered a vegetative state. Nicole's relatives, heartbroken, took Destiny back into their home. I was helping my sister and I cared for Destiny and um, she was hooked to respirators and she was hooked up to feeding tubes and had to have constant monitoring. But when we come down to visit her, you just walk in the room and call her name and she, she acknowledged that she knew you. Her little eyes would fl flutter and she would try to turn her gaze to you. She was still that that cute little destiny we all fell in love with. That was the first time I'd ever seriously considered that maybe that was the way that God was going to send children to my home was through a foster program. We decided that we could do more good by helping um, refugees. They were coming looking for parents while we were looking for children. But even with children looking for families and families looking for children, things may not work out as smoothly as one would imagine. At the time, I was kind of a little discouraged. I say, okay, why are these families seeing me, but I haven't go to any, you know, live with any family? In Nicole's case, it meant finding out, just as her boys were scheduled to arrive, that they wouldn't be allowed to see her yet due to paperwork delays, thereby postponing the creation of the family she craved. I was almost there. I, I was, everything is ready. They're, they're supposed to be here at my house, and... Uh, they didn't come, and my house was quiet again. <laughs> Finally, my mom told the social worker, um, you know, we have two sons and a daughter, and the daughter really like her, and we really would like to have another daughter. And I, and I say, okay, you know, let's go, you know, and they say, well, slow down, you know, we have process to do before you go, and I say, oh, I don't care. Let's go, you know. Eventually, Nicole's children were cleared to move into their new home. And when they came through my door, I just knew they were home. They were my kids. Um, they came up the stairs and it was all I could do. I had to reach out and just, just touch them to make sure they were real. Is this a dream for them? To make that dream come true, you should see their faces. They just like, wow, okay, I'm safe, I'm part of you know, the family. I mean, after I heard their names, I was attached, but after a month of them being in our home, you probably would have had to sedate me to have them removed because they were, they were my children. The, I knew that they needed parents as badly as we needed children. By their small gestures, it was reassuring that, that they had the, the parents that they were looking for. Um, they, at one point, they created a Facebook account and they um, attached our last name to theirs which was kind of heart-rendering that they, they felt close enough to us to want to take on our name. The initial getting to know you phase can occasionally produce some misunderstandings. I, I googled um, food from Congo and I learned that they make like a beans and rice dish and so I made this huge pot of beans and rice and when they got there they looked at it and it wasn't the way they expected it. They wanted their beans separated from their rice. <laughs> and so we, it's like, but they ate it. They were really polite and they ate it. And then, and then later they told me, don't mix the beans again. <laughs> I was scared of the dogs. When they tell me to go like, to put my hand on the dog, they were so scared I knew they were gonna bite me or something. While refugee children may find themselves in a safe place with a foster family, 
the residual trauma of what they experience can still haunt them. Um, the first couple of months they were here, I have um, the middle child sleeps in the room below us and I could hear him scream out at the nighttime. He was having night terrors. And so I just wait at the, the door frame until he would settle down. And I'd ask him in the morning, I said, I, I heard you screaming, is everything okay? And he's like, no, I didn't, I didn't scream, that wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't hear anything, I didn't do anything. And after probably about a month of him doing this, um, one night, in the middle of the night, he woke up and he saw me and he says, you've been standing there the whole time, haven't you? And so I, I think him knowing that I was there helped save off his nightmares because after that point, he didn't have any nightmares. He didn't have any more nightmares after that. I think they feel guilty that they survived and they're now in a, in a, comp in a country that they're safe and secure, why they know that they saw a family that's in the middle of the war-torn country. Why me leaving? and why not my older sister or my younger sister. People, my social worker and Catholic community services give me the second chance. How can I give that back? For refugee children, giving back can often mean searching out loved ones they lost contact with during their journey. Those lucky enough to find them may experience some confusing and conflicting emotions. I found my brother on Facebook and we Skyped once and we saw the whole family sitting there. It was a happy time and we didn't want to stop. Like, we didn't want to let them go because we haven't seen them for seven years. It took them a week to tell me that they'd actually made contact with their mom and they kept it like it was a secret. And the oldest one, Steve, had told me, I was afraid that if you knew my parents were alive, that you would send us back to Africa. She kept reaching through the, through the computer, the Skyping system, to give us hugs, and it kept blowing us kisses. And, and it, it, you know, it was an emotional reunion. She was real, and, and she cared about her children, and I cared about the boys as much as she did. And we could, there was that mutual bond, almost like, um, you know, the umbilical cord never leaves the children. I think there was an adopted umbilical cord. If you look out there, you still see some thousands of underage in the refugee camp. When you, that kind of person finds himself here, he will never forget you. One of the most heartwarming aspects of refugee children finding their biological families is the potential for them to be reunited here in the U.S. For Bo, it took seven years but she was able to bring the rest of her family to Utah. When refugee children reconnect with their biological family, it doesn't diminish the love they feel for their foster family. In fact, their reaction highlights their seemingly infinite capacity for love. Until now, I still have a lot of good relationship with my family. I still call them, you know, mom and dad. I have people that care about me, but now I have more people that care about me. And the love of our parents, like everything they did for us, being there for us for everything. It kind of made us think that we have new parents, even though they cannot change our real parents. But it's normal to have two parents, like to have an American mom and an African mom. We love all of them because they're everything. It was, um, it was great because um, I, I told both of my mom, everybody need more moms. Two is not enough. Bo found a way to give back and help other refugee children. She is currently the Refugee Foster Care Coordinator for Catholic Community Services, a program which now has more than 60 refugee children placed in foster homes in and around Salt Lake City. Nicole now fosters five of those children. Steve, meanwhile, is an award-winning singer and recently made his professional debut with a renowned musical theater company. He's working on creating his first album. Ellie is still in school and enjoys theater class. He also hopes to have a driver's license soon. Favor also loves music. He plays the guitar and writes his own songs, including ones which deal with everything he has journeyed through on his way to Utah. Refugee foster care children will remain in the program until they are 21 years old which helps them graduate high school, move on to higher education or find work, and pursue their dreams. For them, their journey continues on, with a brighter future ahead of them. She
Well, I'm